here in just a second. So I think we've resolved our issue here. It'll be just a minute now. You know, I'll be honest with you, we've we've done this before, but we don't do it very frequently, so we tend to forget how to do it. It's all like me to so, Paul, I'm going to stay behind the screen here so they can see me. So, I'm not being rude. Okay. <laughs> All right, they're live, so we're good. All right, welcome to, to, to Apex Truck School Permit Prep Class. Um, you should all have a green folder. I'd like to go over the insert, the uh, CDL Permit Class Checklist that's inside of your green folder. So I'd like to go over this material, please, all right? So first off, um, this is telling you what you need. These are the mechanics of getting you a permit, okay? Um, Not sure if they pack, if these guys can see me here. Let me double check. Yes. We good? No, nope, I'm. I got to bring the students into the school or into the uh, into the classroom and provide them with the phone number to call. With so I'll be ready in two minutes. Okay. All right. Let me know. Okay. Hi, welcome to those of you in South St. Paul joining us for our class on the CDL permit. All right, you should all have one of these green folders. The first thing I want to do is go over the insert inside the cover, the front cover. This thing says CDL permit checklist. So I'd like to go over this checklist with you first, all right? Now, the first thing this is telling you is what documents you need in order to get the permit. Um, you need a regular car license, obviously. You need some form of identification as prescribed by the state, and that includes either a valid passport or a certified birth certificate. Now, what's a certified birth certificate? One with the stamp on it. These guys are so picky, they won't even accept an original birth certificate. We've had people go in. I mean, this is the birth certificate with your feet prints on it. And they will no, that's not a certifying copy. Are you kidding me? I got it from the hospital when I was born. No, that's not good enough. So they're really anal when it comes to this stuff, right? 
So you got to get a certified birth certificate or have a valid passport in order to get a CDL permit. And then every time you go in to renew your, get your license or renew your license, you'll have to do the same thing. It, it just fascinates me. You know, I've been licensed in the state of Minnesota for 52 years. And every time I renew, I got to go in and prove that I'm the same person I've been for the last 52 damn years. I was like, are you kidding me? I'm still me here. See the piece of paper? Good God. But these, this is a federal rule. We have to uh, step up the plate and do that. All right. Okay. Now, how many of you have a handout that says Trucking Truth on it? Yeah. Look at your handout. The number four. Does it say Trucking Truth? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hang on a second. I have to call my office. Because uh, what we're going to do, we're going to get you a the corrected version that has the proper website to go to for practicing. Hey, Matt, is uh, Melissa available? From what? Okay. All right. Is Susan there? Okay. May I speak to Susan? I got to get you the correct information. Not having the correct information is just not acceptable here. Susan, the permit prep checklist has the wrong website on it for the online practice test. It's supposed to have cdltest.co not truckingtruth.com. Can you find the one that says cdltest.co? Print that out for everybody there in South St. Paul and give it to them. Then scan that and email it to Laura. Call Laura, tell her that I need those printed and brought into the room as soon as possible. And then when you find whatever you've got with Trucking Truth on it, huh? And then when you find whatever you have with Trucking Truth on it, it needs to be deleted. Okay? Thank you. Bye-bye. I don't like Trucking Truth, people. It doesn't give you accurate test questions. And I replaced this a year and a half ago, but apparently my staff can't. Well, I'll leave it there. <laughs> so I want you to go to cdltest.co. I'm going to get you the proper information shortly. All right. <clears throat> all right. Now, the manual is available online. The online version of the manual is a very uh, powerful learning tool. Because first of all, the thing that I like, I'll show those of you here in uh, uh, in Hudson, what I'm talking about here. I'm going to go to the manual here on the screen. So you go to uh, mindriveinfo.org, go to more documents, and you put the manual up. Now, one of the things that I like about the manual, let's get to the air brake chapter here. So here's information about the air brake. And here's what I like about this. I can go from this type size that you see here. Let me show you in South St. Paul when I'm looking at that. So there's the uh, there's the way the manual looks like on uh, the screen initially. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this. 
And by blowing it up, now I can read the darn thing, okay? So I like the fact that I can blow it up to a, a size where it's easy to read, right? Now, the other thing that I like about the way the online manual works is the search engine is very accurate. You can find exactly what you're looking for. I type in control F to create a search box. Then whatever I type in, I get exactly that information. And, and so like if I type in Slack adjusters, I'll only get the plural of Slack adjusters. I won't get just the word Slack. I won't get the word just. I will get specifically what I typed in. And so what that enables me to... Pardon? The control F, where do you do that at? On the keyboard. I mean, in the Google search? No, once you got the manual on the screen, so you go to mindriveinfo.org. I've, I've I actually have it on the screen. Okay. Well, I'm not talking about in a downloaded version. I'm talking about looking at it on their website. And then hit control F and I can type in whatever I'm looking for. So if you're downloading it, you're probably downloading it as a PDF. So then the, the search engine is based on the PDF criteria. And, and that might be different than what how this works. See, it's just frustrating with some search engines. You hit You hit the search box and it finds all kinds of different variations of whatever you typed in. And so then you're looking at, you know, 185 different things trying to find what you want, whereas this will narrow it, narrow your search down. So I like that, okay? Now, <clears throat> the next thing on your checklist here, the audio file. Those of you here in Hudson, you heard me talk about the audio file um, or the section on the inspection test earlier today. That audio file is available for every section of the manual. Now, if you look at number three on my checklist here, that tells you which sections of the manual you need to study for whatever license you're looking for, whatever permit and then license you're looking for. So for class A, you would study sections one, two, three, five, and six. For class B, you would study sections one, two, three, and five. Each of those is also available on an audio file. Again, through mindriveinfo.org. Click on more documents and you can find those sections of the CDL manual. Again, I believe in audio books is a very powerful uh, learning tool. Now, if we look at that audio file for just a second here, It'll tell us how long each of those sections are. So, section six, combination vehicles. This section covers. So section six is 43 minutes long. Section five is 42 minutes long. So that's an hour and a half. Section one is another 41 minutes. So that's uh, two hours and 15 minutes you've got invested. Section three is 13 minutes. So now you're at two and a half hours. And then section two, look at this. Look how long section two is. Three hours and 15 minutes. You've got five hours and 45 minutes worth of material that needs to be covered here if you're doing class A, sections one, two, three, five, and six. Now, how many people do you suppose spend six hours reading this manual? Some do. So one out of four raised their hand here. That's 25%, okay? So, and I'd say that's probably accurate, that about 25% of the people that are working on this read the whole dang thing. Now, again, I'm a real believer as in audio files as a learning tool. I highly recommend that if you can create an opportunity to listen to the manual, that you listen to it. Now, there is a federal rule in play that says everything on a test has to be in the manual. It's a federal rule. So the manual is the very accurate resource for you to learn the correct answers on the test. Listening to the audio is gonna put the words in your head that are gonna be the correct answers on the test. It is that simple, okay? 
So highly recommend the audio uh, available at mindriveinfo.org. All right. Okay. Now, <clears throat> next thing on our checklist here, it says one permit test on any one subject allowed per day. Your first and second attempt at a permit test in Minnesota is free. If you fail any one subject twice, they'll start charging you $10 for additional attempts. There's no limit to the number of attempts they'll give you. You just keep paying 10 bucks, okay? All right, I got a question here. Hello? Okay, good. And then she'll bring it in. Awesome. Okay, thank, thank you. All right, all right. All right. <clears throat> so we've got those uh, forums on the way. So that's good news. All right. Let me do something here that's going to help me a little bit. I've got this checklist in front of me. It's going to help me. All right. Um, is anybody here a Wisconsin resident? Okay. So all Minnesota residents. Uh, and incidentally, uh, those of you in South St. Paul, if you have any questions, uh, give the phone number that Josh has given you uh, a call. Give that number a call. I'll answer it and uh, answer any questions you might have. All right, so you can take as many tests as you want. The interesting thing over in Wisconsin, uh, they don't charge for any test, but they limit it to five. Minnesota, there's no limit to the number of tests that they'll give you, okay? Yes? No, not if you're a Minnesota resident. If you're a Minnesota resident, you take the Minnesota test. The only test you're allowed to take in Wisconsin is the skills test, okay? But, but you have to have a permit from the home state because that's where you're licensed. Make sense? All right. They do allow the road testing, but now, see, you're going to be road tested in Wisconsin. You're still going to end up with a Minnesota license. All right. The next paragraph on your checklist, uh, the test is available on paper or with a computer. Now, most exam stations will require your first test on the computer. The computer has headphones where it will read you the test questions. Now, some people find that to be advantageous. Personally, I don't like the audio because it reads it to me too quickly. When I take a test, the thing that I have to be most conscientious about is I really have to slow down how I think about a test question. I will make snap decisions too quickly when I take a test and I'll get answers wrong because of it. As an example, there may very well be a question on your test that says this, the amount of tread depth on tires other than front tires is, what's the correct answer? Front tires See, you just got tricked by the question. And part of it is you're getting up and moving at the same time I was asking the question. So you heard, you heard the following, tread depth and front tires. Listen to the question again. The tread depth on tires other than front tires is? Exactly. See, what's your first name? Mark. Mark. What Mark experiences is the same thing that happens to me. I hear this and this, and there's one or two words I didn't hear. For whatever reason, my little brain skipped over one or two words. See, and they write the test questions that way on purpose. Okay? On purpose they do that. Because they're trying to get people to fail the test. Had they asked the question, what is the tread depth on rear tires? You would have got it right. No doubt in my mind, as would I. 
So that's why I don't like the headphones because sometimes the headphones are reading it to me so fast that I miss every single word. So I'm better off not listening to the headphones and, and really looking at the question, all right? So the advantage of the computer is no advantage to me. The paper version is advantageous to me for two reasons. First of all, I can skip questions. Now, when I skip questions, that I can't tell you how many times I remember something after the fact. You know, ask me something, I'm like, oh, geez, I can't remember that guy's name. Five minutes later, I remember it. Or maybe question number seven stumps me, and question number 23 jogs my memory. Okay? The computer in Minnesota. Wisconsin's computer does allow you to skip questions, but Minnesota doesn't. Minnesota, and if anybody from the Minnesota Department of Public Safety is listening, I'm going to tell you right to your eyeballs, your system sucks. Get this. There is a federal rule that says if your permit expires, the state is not required to retest you to issue a new permit. Guess what Minnesota is going to do? Test you. Wisconsin doesn't. If your permit expires in Wisconsin, you go in and get a new one. In Minnesota? You gotta take a test. Now, why do you gotta take a test? You passed it 180 days ago. You don't to just fill in the blank, okay? So, why doesn't their computer allow you to skip questions? Because they want people to fail. Okay? The paper version, I can skip questions. Here's the other advantage to the paper version. With the computer, when you enter an answer, it scores you immediately and lets you know if you got it wrong. So if you get one wrong, the computer goes, eh. I don't like that. Because now my little brain again is distracted and I'm going, oh, that's, that's one. Yeah. And if I get it, oh, yeah, that's two. And I start to get nervous. I start to get upset. I started to get frustrated. So for me, this is an ignorance is bliss routine. I'm better off not knowing if I got an answer wrong the first time. So I would prefer to take it on paper. Now, here's what's interesting about this process. The test is available on paper or with a computer. That's exactly what it says in the manual. That is verbatim out of the manual. But you go to the Egan exam station, Arden Hills, Plymouth, Chaska, Anoka, any of the metro exam stations that are open four or five days a week, and they'll require you to take it on the computer. Now, there are 92 places in the state of Minnesota to take a permit test, and there's only about a dozen of them that have the computer. The other 80 don't have the computers. They have only on paper, okay? All right? Thank you very much. Now, and uh, Laura? All of these need to be corrected, apparently. Oh, Put back in here. Um, it would be helpful to reprint that then, too. Okay. So ask, ask her to send you that. I just printed whatever Susan gave me. Yeah, she just gave you this page. No, I printed four pages. Oh, you did? Yeah. Okay. So what's on the back of what are the pages she sent you? Are there six pages or something? Oh, so she sent you the whole thing. Yeah. Is it the Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So now you guys in South St. Paul should have the correct information also. All right, back to my paper one. I like the paper version, okay? I also don't like it when a government agency discriminates against me or anybody I know. How can a state agency force you to do something that someone else is not forced to do? You have to take it on the computer. If you went to Red Wing, they don't have a computer. How would you take it in Red Wing? On paper. So if Joe has the right to take it on paper in Red Wing, do you have the right to take it on paper in Egan? If you believe in the United States Constitution, the Bill of Rights, you do. You absolutely, positively, unequivocally have the right to be treated equal by any government agency in the United States of America. If you want to take it on paper at Egan or Chaska or Arden Hills or Plymouth or Lake Street in Minneapolis or downtown St. Paul, go in there, ask to take a CDL test. If they tell you, okay, go on to machine number six, politely say, I'd like to take it on paper, please. They'll refuse. I promise you they will refuse you. Very politely, very professionally say, I'd like to speak to a supervisor, please. The supervisor will make you wait on purpose. They will never come out immediately. As soon as they're told somebody wants to talk to them, they'll find something to do for 45 minutes just to piss you off. Then they'll come out, and then you very politely, in a very calm voice, explain, I'd like to take it on paper, please. Well, no, we have a policy. And <laughs> I don't care about a government policy that discriminates. Rosa Parks is my hero. Rosa Parks had the audacity to stand up to a cop and say, no, I'm not going to the back of the bus. I don't care what your policy is. You're going to treat me equally under the law. And I'd bring that up. I'd say, you know what? Rosa Parks didn't go to the back of the bus, and I'm not taking it on a computer. I'm taking it on paper because I have a right to be treated equally by a government agency. You are a government agency. You are required by the United States Constitution to treat me equally. People can take this on paper at other locations. I'm taking it on paper today. I'll wait. Okay? And at that point, they'll probably say, did you go to that damn interstate truck time at school? All right, damn it. <laughs> they don't like me downtown. Trust me, they don't like me. Okay? If you want to take it on paper, you have every right to do that. Next paragraph. You must arrive at least one hour. Before the exam station closes to take a test, I'd even suggest more than an hour ahead of time. Now, those of you doing class A, you have to take three knowledge tests. General knowledge, air brakes, and combinations. General knowledge is 50 questions. Air brakes is 30 questions. Combination is 20 questions. Total, 100 questions. How long will it take you to get through 100 questions? Probably take me an hour and a half. Yeah, I'll get to that in a second. But yes, you can you can do it either way. All right. There's no time limit other than their closing time. So if you got there at eight o'clock in the morning, you got till four thirty. Okay, yeah, all day. No pressure there. Again, there's 92 locations to take the test in Minnesota. You can find the location nearest you by going to mindriveinfo.org. Next paragraph. You can take one subject at a time if that works best for you. You can take all three of them in the same setting or you can split them up. You can split them up one day to the next or you can even split them up the same day. In other words, you could go in at 8.30, take your general knowledge quiz, complete that, leave for a time, go in the parking lot, Roll a window down, sit in your car, listen to some easy listening music that helps you study, read the section on the air brake test, and then go in and take your air brake test. Complete that. I'll be back. Go out in the parking lot again, study for another hour, go back in and take your 
combinations test. So you can do that. You do not have to do it in one setting. You can do it in one setting. It's up to you. If you pass the test, they'll hold on to your score sheet. If you fail the test, remember you're only allowed one test on any one subject per day. If you fail a test at one location, don't get in your car, drive to a different location because they have entered you into their system. And so that other location is gonna know about that previous test that same day. Now, should you pass a test and need to come back to complete further tests to get what you want, make certain you have a copy of a document that proves that you have passed a test. Do not walk out of that building without something in hand that proves you have passed the test. And we need to take this a step further. Any tests you pass, whether they are the knowledge for the permit or any portion of the driving tests, retain those copies. Now, those of you testing road testing over here in Minnesota, there won't be a written verification of your passing a test. It, it's an electronic system with what we're doing over here, okay? But once you get your uh, license, make sure you hang on to documents, all right? Now, the reason I'm bringing this to your attention is the state of Minnesota is notorious for making mistakes on documents, and it will mess you up. We had a student recently who was not allowed to get a CDL permit because the on his driver's license, the city that he lived in was misspelled. And when they discovered the city was misspelled, they made him request a new license and wouldn't allow him to get the permit until the new license was issued, the plastic, the hard copy. Now, are you kidding me? It was Edina and it was misspelled. And his getting a permit was delayed about eight weeks as a result of that. Now, my point is when he got his license in the mail, he should have looked at it and made certain it had no errors. Having discovered the error, he should have gone in immediately and got it corrected, okay? We are seeing people get class B licenses when they tested in A's. We're seeing the opposite, people getting A licenses having tested in B's. We're seeing people get restrictions to automatics when they use manuals. We're seeing people who tested in uh, yeah, in an automatic, get an unrestricted license and vice versa. Test with a manual and end up with an automatic restriction. Guys, it happens all the time. These people are incompetent. If you're watching Department of Public Safety, you're incompetent. Okay? I couldn't work for these people. I'd go ballistic in about the first three hours. We've had students, we had a student some time ago apply for his license, having passed the test, he got a letter from the state that said there was no record of his road test. He took a road test on June 21st, 2016 at 12.30 in the afternoon. In July, he got a letter that said there's no record of your road test. Now, the bad news is he had lost the original documentation, okay? Or put it through the wash or something, but he didn't have that. He came back to us and he said, do you guys have a copy of that paperwork? And we looked at his file. He had not come back and given us a copy of it, so we had no copy. But because I'm such a believer in documentation, I have dash cameras in all my trucks. And in Minnesota, I actually had to sue the state of Minnesota, take them to court, and get a judge to rule in my favor to allow cameras in the trucks. Okay. Now, Wisconsin, incidentally, is also attempting to prohibit that. Uh, I'm letting things kind of work their way out. I, I haven't sued him yet, but eventually I'll get to that over here, too. So anyway, we have dash cameras in the trucks. <clears throat> and incidentally, there still are examiners out there that will disconnect them, even though I've got a judge's order requiring that they don't. But they still do it. They still defy a judge's order. 
tells you what kind of agency the Minnesota Department of Public Safety is. So we have this on videotape, this guy passing the test. We've got a video of the examiner. Congratulations, uh, you passed your test today. Now here's, let me go over what you did. Okay, now here's your paperwork. You can go get in your license. And in this guy's situation, he didn't have his uh, certified birth certificate with him. So he couldn't get the license right there at that point. So he asked the examiner, now can I go to Chaska tomorrow? Yeah, you can go to Chaska. So we got this whole conversation on video, right? So what we did, didn't take us but 15 minutes, Pat found the video and I had Pat play it on a monitor and then I had this young man video it with his phone. And I said, take the video, go back to the exam station and show it to him. He goes out there, they refuse to even look at it. He's got a video of one of their employees telling him, congratulations, you passed your test. And they won't even look at it. He calls me up and tells me that he's still being stonewalled. And I said, okay, who's the supervisor? Who's working today? Jessica, he says. I said, okay, tell Jessica. Wow, that was fast. Thank you very much. Um, tell Jessica. I'm calling my attorney right now. His name's Paul Applebaum. He'll be reaching out to you shortly. I'm also calling my friends at KSTPA uh, television. I am going to play this video for them and we're gonna come out and interview you. You're gonna be there the rest of the day? Got a phone call five minutes later. Oh, it's taken care of now. So I had to threaten legal action and exposing them in the media and oh, all of a sudden they figured it out. Now here's, here's what's so frustrating guys. The, the guy, the examiner that messed this kid up still works there. And we have seen at least a half a dozen mistakes he's made in the last two years with other people. Has he been fired? If anything, he'll get promoted someday because he's an income poop. Okay. Don't trust these people with these documents. Be very anal about it. Let's say for the sake of discussion, you pass a test and you say, I'll be back in an hour. And they say, well, we'll hold on to your paperwork. Can I have a copy of it? No, don't worry about it. So you go out in the parking lot. 15 minutes later, the person who's got your paperwork gets a call from his or her daycare center. Their kid is sick. Where's that person going? Oh, go get the kid because daycare is kicking them out, right? Those are your parents. Know what I'm talking about. So you go back in 45 minutes later. Uh, yeah, I was here a little bit earlier. I passed my uh, general knowledge. Hmm, well, we can't find any paperwork on that. Well, there was a gap. Well, she had to leave. I, I took it two hours ago when I passed it. Oh, well, why don't you take it again? If you passed it once, you can pass it again. Can you imagine when this kid went out with a video proving that he passed his test? And they're telling them, no, nah, we don't even want to look at your video. We don't give a crap that you got video, video documentation that we messed up. We ain't looking at it. You're screwed, young man, because we don't care. I mean, what an agency. So document, 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 okay? All right. Now, the last sentence here, you need to complete a CDL medical self-certification form when you get your permit. Turn to the very last page in the handout you were just given the very last page in the handout you were just given has the CDL medical self-certification form that you will need to fill out when you get your permit. You can use the form in front of you right there. When you get your permit? Yes. Oh, well, you can do it. You have to fill the form out to get the permit. You will fill it out again to get the license. You will fill it out again every renewal. Okay? What you are doing here is you are certifying with the state, this is a federal requirement, you are certifying with the state whether you have a current medical card or not, okay? Now, you need a medical card in order to get paid to drive a commercial motor vehicle. You do not need a medical card to drive a vehicle that's commercial if you're not getting paid. Apex, this is Bill. Good. Yep.
No, you'll have to. They, they used to. Uh, this gentleman is upgrading from class B to class A. And it used to be that you could just take the combination and they would they would do that for you. But no longer. You'll have to take the whole thing. Yep. Okay. All right. So back to the CDL medical self-certification form. All right. Now, you can drive a vehicle that meets the weight threshold of a CDL vehicle without a medical certificate being valid, as long as you're not getting paid. Or there are some government jobs where you don't need it also. All right. Now, why would a person need or want a license for a class A or class B to drive something that they don't get paid for? Well, what if you own a horse and you go to horse shows and you have a truck and trailer big enough that a CDL is required, but this is not your business. This is not how you make money. You're competing for ribbons. This is a non-commercial use. You don't need a medical for that. So this form has four different options. The first two options are interstate, exempt or non-exempt, and the second two are intrastate, exempt and non-exempt. Now, intrastate is staying within a state border with this commercial vehicle. Who would be confined to intrastate? Two types of people, under age 21. If you're 18, 19, or 20, 20 years old, you can get a class A or a class B license, but you're not allowed to drive interstate. Therefore, you're an intrastate driver. You can go to work for a landscaper, you can haul gravel, but you can't haul anything that involves interstate commerce. Even if you're staying within the state of Minnesota, you can't haul anything that came from outside of Minnesota. Midwest Fence, our neighbor and landlord in South St. Paul there, when they take a load of chain link fence from their facility in South St. Paul to West St. Paul to install it, that is interstate commerce. Why? The chain link fence came from Ohio. It was put on a truck, delivered to their facility from Ohio by picking it up out of the yard, putting it in one of their little trucks and taking it to West St. Paul is furtherance of an interstate commerce transportation. So that's interstate commerce. Intrastate is very limited. Sand and gravel would be the primary intrastate license. Garbage, maybe, as long as the garbage is not being shipped to another state to be incinerated, all right? The second person that would uh, gravitate towards an intrastate restriction is a person who cannot pass an interstate DOT physical but can pass a state level intrastate physical. Examples, with vision, you have to be able to see 2040 in both eyes to go interstate. 2040 with one eye is sufficient for intrastate. So you can get a commercial license and a DOT health card for intrastate blind in one eye but you can't for interstate unless you have three years experience driving commercial vehicles. So if a current commercial vehicle driver with three years experience has a problem with one eye, they can get a waiver and continue. The new person that has a problem with vision in one eye would have to get three years experience intrastate before they'd be allowed to apply for and be granted the waiver to drive interstate. But that's an example, okay? All right. Now, the kicker of this is when you are required to have the DOT physical, so in other words, you're going to get paid. So now you got to have this. Now, you can get the permit and the license without the physical. Remember, training over here in Wisconsin, gentlemen, you do need to get the DOT physical. But just for the sake of discussion, you get your license without having it. All you got to do is get the physical before you go to work for somebody. 
So it's conceivable that somebody shows up at eight o'clock in the morning on a Monday to start a job. I, well, I need to see your license and your physical. Oh, well, here's my license. I don't have the physical yet. Well, go get the dang thing. There's a guy right down the road. Call him up. Go in there. He can do it for you. And come on back when you're done. An hour later, you're back with your DOT physical. Yep, I got it. Here we go. All right, let's put you to work. It can be that quick, all right? But now notice what the form says. On category A, interstate non-exempt, which means it's required, it says current medical certificate from a certified medical examiner must be submitted. So what happens is the state of Minnesota knows that your, when your medical expires, because you have to provide them a copy of it. And on that copy, it has the expiration date, all right? Now, yes? You got no medical card, you have to renew it. When it expires, you have to renew it, yeah. Absolutely. In order to be, get the DOT, right? Well, you gotta go take the DOT physical, then you have to resubmit with the form and a copy of the current physical. You can do that in person or via fax. Okay, so you can fax it in, all right? Now, the state of Minnesota knows when your DOT health card expires. The way this system works now, once, you're, once they have you in the computer, then you no longer have to carry the card with you. It used to be all we had to do is carry the card with us. That isn't true anymore. They changed that. And they reason that they changed that when that was the deal, when all you had to do is carry this with you. The truck stops sold blank ones of these for four bucks. <laughs> How hard was it to have a DOT health card in your wallet? Four bucks and a friend with lousy penmanship, you got a health card, right? Now, fraudulent, yes, but on a day-to-day -day enforcement basis, people were getting away with it. So about three years ago is when they changed the law requiring that you go to a certified physician, one that is registered with the feds, take a physical from that person, and then submit a copy to the state so the state knows when it expires. Now, again, once you're in the system, you don't have to carry the card anymore because you're in the system. <clears throat> and you got to be in the system within 15 days of getting the card. So for the sake of discussion, let's say you get a DOT physical, a new one. You don't resubmit the documents, and you've got this in your wallet 30 days later. You're driving illegally. Okay? They have to have a copy of it. It's got to be in the system. You'll get a ticket even though you got this in your pocket. All right? Now, when your health card is, a, is about to expire, two months in advance, you're going to get a notice from the state. I just got one last week, guys. My medical, this medical right here, expires June 5th. So on April 5th, the state of Minnesota sent me a letter letting me know that my medical is about to expire and telling me, if you wish to maintain your CDL driving privilege, you must resubmit a current physical by June 5th. What happens if I don't resubmit by June 5th? What happens on June 6th? Exactly, my CDL is pulled. On the 6th of June, I got a class D license again. Now, if I figure this out within 12 months and correct it, they'll reinstate my CDL. But if I go 366 days, then what? I got to start all over from scratch. Take the permit test, pass the permit test, wait 14 days, then take a road test, and hopefully I'll pass the dang thing. Okay? We have come across many people, dozens of people over the last couple of years that have lost their CDL because they forgot. See, and here's the thing. People go in to renew my, their license. Now, my license expires in three years. 
Uh, yeah, I'm here to renew my license here, please. My class. Uh, gee, Mr. Cowens, uh, you don't have a CDL anymore. Uh, ma'am. So it's class A right there. Well, you had a class A, but June 5th of 2019, your medical expired and you didn't renew it. Well, hey, I renewed the thing. In fact, I got a, I got a new one right here. See, look, I got a brand new physical. It's right here. Are we good? Well, you can go take your permit test. I've lost my CDL. I'm back at square one. And the new driver training rules, you would be required to go back to truck driving school before you're allowed to take a test. And gentlemen, this new rule that comes into play February of, of next year, we're going to bump our price at least a thousand bucks for each program. So what we do for five grand this year is going to be six grand next year. And you ain't going to have any choice. What new rule coming up with? February 7th of 2020, the full 160 hour training program is required before you take a test. Until February of 2020. We got it. Right. Right. Exactly. That's going away. Yep. The 100 hour course won't exist. It's got to be the full, the full Monty, the full nine yards, the whole shebang. Pardon? Oh, we'll do class B's. Uh, price will go up on that too. Um, is what it is, okay? Don't forget to renew your CDL medical card, okay? When it expires, renew it and resubmit this form. Don't forget to do that. Now, let me throw one more possibility on you. So the physical, if you're healthy, your physical is good for two years. I'm on blood pressure meds, so I have, my physical is only good for a year at a time, okay? I'm working on my blood pressure. It's getting better. I hope that I can get off the meds someday. So if I can get off the meds, I'll go back to a two-year physical. But if I'm still taking meds to keep my blood pressure down, then I'm stuck with the one-year deal, right? But let's say for the sake of discussion, you, get, you go through all of this, you get everything, right? Two years from now, you get a different job. Now you're not driving truck, okay? And you get the form in the mail that says your medical is expired. Take this form, fill it out, and check exempt. What's that mean? I ain't getting paid to drive a truck for a mile. Check exempt, fax it in. You get to keep your CDL as long as you keep paying for it. Because every four years it expires. This the class A will cost you 20 bucks more than a class D. A, a B will cost you 10 more than a B than, than a D. Pay it. Keep that license, guys. You never know when that CDL is going to come in handy someday. Right? Forever. Until you, want to, until you want to be certified again to get paid. Now, there are so many jobs out there. I have this dream that somebody's going to come along and buy me out of the school. Okay? My, my hope is that some big trucking company that needs drivers... He's going to come along and write me a big check. Okay. Actually, my wife is hoping for that more than me. But anyway. <laughs> She's better spend the money. Uh, she just wants me to quit working. But I won't quit working. Okay. I just can't even conceive of that. So I like to spend my winters in Key West. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get a job driving the Key West conch train. And I'm going to drive around in Key West. I'm going to drive past Ernest Hemingway's house. And I'm going to tell all the tourists in the back that can't speak any English all about Ernest Hemingway. Now, it's too dang hot in Florida in the summertime. So in the summertime, I'm going to get the heck out of there. And I'm going to go up the Grand Canyon. And I'm going to go to work for the U.S. Forest Service. And I'm going to drive a tour of bus around in the Grand Canyon. And I'm going to talk to all the tourists in the back that can't speak English about the wonders of the Grand Canyon. And I'm going to get paid to do it. Okay? I'll be collecting my Social Security. I'll be getting the money from that. Life will be great, okay? So what I'm saying is there's so many things you can do with a CDL. 
I suggest that if you go through all the work and effort to get the dang thing in the first place, keep it. And you can always go into the exempt status, stay there as long as you're not getting paid, anytime you want to, as long as you can pass the physical, go back into the certified status. Okay? All right. Now, let's talk about how to pass the test. This manual is published by the um, American Association of Motor Vehicle Administrators. And all of this is, is regulated by the feds. The, the federal government, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration has literally contracted with AMBA, American Association of Motor Vehicle Administrators, to write the manual and write the tests. And again, all of the test questions have to be in the manual. Now, when this knowledge testing process first started, it was the middle 1980s. I've been licensed since 1975. So when I got my license, my commercial license, my class A license, I didn't have to take a knowledge test. I didn't have to do, I had to get a permit, just go in and get it, but I didn't have to take any tests to get the permit. So then in the middle 1980s, when they brought this knowledge testing in, they required all of us that had licenses at that point, they required us to pass the knowledge test to renew a license. And initially, experienced truck drivers were having a lot of trouble passing the, the permit tests. So the feds went back to AMBA and they said, hey guys, all of these truck drivers are having trouble. Is there something that you can do to help them? And what they did is they spread out through um, out the manual these test your knowledge boxes. Okay. Now, those of you in South St. Paul, if you take your green folder that has these sections, go to page 2.8. They don't number the manual one through 100. And those of you here can do the same thing. So look in your manual, look down at the bottom, go to page 2-8, okay? And you'll find this test your knowledge box. 2-8. Now those questions are the questions on the test. I told you a bit ago, it would take you six hours to read the five sections you need to prepare for your CDL permit test. This would be a way of shortcutting that time investment by looking at those questions and then going back within that section, finding and highlighting the correct answer. Now, the first question in the test your knowledge box on page 2.8, the answer is pretty simple, isn't it? Safety. Safety. That's a no-brainer. And that's what it says in the manual. Now, the second one says, what things should you check during a trip? Now, gentlemen, I'm telling you, there's no way you're going to know the right answer without looking it up. You'd have to look it up. You have to look it up. So what I can do to expedite looking this up I put during a trip in my search engine and here it is during a trip check your instruments if you see hear smell or feel anything that might mean trouble check it out that's what you check during a trip so what they're talking about is that during a trip you're using your gauges and your senses that's what it says in the manual okay that's the correct answer gauges and your senses 
The next question on page 2.8, name some key steering system parts. Well, they're identified back on page 2.2, okay? Um, steering box, pitman arm, drag link, tie rod are the steering system parts, okay? Number four, name some suspension system defects. The answer, broken, cracked, shifted, or missing leaf springs, distorted coil springs, leaking shock absorbers, loose U-bolts, or defective spring brackets or hangers. It's all in the manual. Number five. Three kinds of emergency equipment. Anybody know? Flares, triangles, and Okay. Flares and triangles are interchangeable. So that's only one. So triangles, fuses, fire extinguisher. fire extinguisher. Correct. Fire extinguisher has to be properly secured and properly charged. Okay. Number six, minimum tread depth for front tires. 430 seconds. Minimum tread depth for other tires. 230 seconds. Now, incidentally, the audio that we send you guys here in, in school, the audio does say that recaps are not allowed on the front of a vehicle. That's not true. Recaps are allowed on the front of trucks, not allowed in the front of a bus. So the audio that the state puts out is slightly incorrect, right? Number seven, name some things you should check on the front of your vehicle during a walk around inspection. Lights. Their answer, look underneath it for leaking fluids. That's the correct answer to that question. Are the lights on the front? Well, certainly they are, but that's not what they were talking about. The correct answer is look for leaking fluids underneath the vehicle. Number eight, what should wheel bearing seals be checked for? Leaks. Leaks, exactly. Number nine, how many red reflective triangles should you carry? Three. Three. Number 10, how do you test hydraulic brakes for leaks? Pump the brakes, how many times? Three. And then what? For how long? Uh, Four seconds. I can't remember. Five. <laughs> Pump the brake pedal three times, hold for five seconds. Okay? Pump three times, hold for five seconds. Unless you hear that from me or read it in the manual, you're going to get it wrong. How would you possibly know the correct answer without referring to the manual? Now, if it takes six hours to read through these sections... How are you going to know which part of that six hours you need to remember? Well, test your knowledge tells you. I would recommend that you read the entire section, but I would for certain find the answers to these questions in the section and highlight them. You then have the perfect study guide. The 11th one is a no-brainer. Why put the starter switch key in your pocket during a pre-trip inspection? So nobody drives off while you're underneath the vehicle inspecting it. Okay, That would be rather hazardous to one's health. All right. The next test your knowledge section is on page 2-10. First question on page 2-10 in the test your knowledge box. Why should you back towards the driver's side? So you can see better, correct? Number two, if stopped on a hill, how can you start moving without rolling back? Well, first of all, they're presuming we're driving a manual transmission. And what the manual tells you is, is that you should use your parking brake 
or if your tractor trailer is equipped with a brake lever on the dashboard, use that to hold the brake until you start to release the clutch. Now, the truth is, guys, you don't have to do either one of those things. Today's trucks with these diesel motors have so much torque to them. It's really simple. You would put on a hill, you would put the vehicle, if you had a manual, in first gear. Your foot's on the brake at that point. Your clutch is in. You push the clutch in to put it in gear. Simply release the clutch enough so that you feel the clutch start to engage. Then take your foot off the brake. Then smoothly take your foot off the clutch to release it. Engage it, actually. The truck will go. This is not a 1972 Pinto that is going to buck, snort, and stall on you. Okay? These things have massive amounts of torque. Feather that clutch out nice and easy. It's got electronic fuel injection. So the motor will actually sense that it needs more fuel application, more throttle application, and it'll do it automatically because it's electronic anyway. The thing will go just fine. This is completely unnecessary, but that's the correct answer. All right? Second question on page 2-10. If stopped on a hill, well, oh, that's the second one. All right, third question. When backing, why is it important to use a helper? Blind spots. Blind spots. To avoid blind spots, that's the key word. That's in the menu, okay? Uh, incidentally, if you are using a spotter, if you ever lost sight of them, what would you do? Stop. Stop. Very good, okay? Um, number four, what's the most important hand signal that you and the helper should agree on? Stop. Yeah. Uh, number five, what are the two special conditions where you should downshift? Downhill and curves. Correct. Number five, when should you downshift automatic transmissions? Downhills. Now, what the manual doesn't recognize is today's technology, the automatic transmissions in these trucks downshift themselves, guys. I have a, a small pickup with a diesel. It downshifts itself. I've got a Dodge Ram 5500 with a good size of 6.2 liter diesel. It downshifts itself. I've got a big rig that I run around the country with. It's got an auto shift transmission. It downshifts itself, guys. All I got to do is slow down. I don't have to manually downshift today's automatic transmission because the manual was initially written in the 1980s. It doesn't recognize that new technology. So that's why there's mandating that you downshift the thing. Okay. Number seven, retarders keep you from skidding when the road is slippery. True or false? False. False. Now, what's a retarder? It is an engine brake. The engine brake retarder system was invented in 1960 by an engineer working for the Cummins Motor Company. What it does, it shuts off the fuel in the motor, closes, to a significant degree anyway, the exhaust valves in the motor, creating back pressure. Now, a motor with fuel pumped into it, compressing and combusting, exploding, drives us down the road. The engine retarder flips that process. And rather than putting fuel in, it doesn't. And rather than allowing the exhaust to be pushed out by the piston into the exhaust system, the exhaust valves close up. And now the piston can't push the exhaust out without a ton of resistance. That creates a braking effect in the motor. So when the fuel is on, the motor is driving you forward. When the engine retarder is on, the motor is holding you back. It is connected obviously to the rear wheels on a truck. So if you are braking with the rear wheels of a truck when it's slippery, what would happen? The back of the truck would skid. Okay, 
Did any of you, when you were young, when it snowed, go find a big parking lot at night? All the time. Yep. And did you use your e-brake? Yep. And what, and what would... Have e -brakes when I was in. <laughs> well, yeah, you did. It was a pedal. It was a so you had to hold the release when you hit it with your foot. The guys had the both ways. Yeah. And that was great fun, wasn't it? Yep. Sliding around sideways. Okay. Well, you don't want to be just sliding around sideways a big truck, right? Now, the manual says that the retarder should not be used when the road is icy, wet, or snow covered. As far as wet goes, I don't agree with them. Especially if your truck is loaded, you've got plenty of traction when it's wet. Now, if you were bobtailing, what's bobtailing? This is bobtailing, the tractor with no trailer attached. We call that bobtail. And you have very little traction in this configuration. So don't use an engine brake when you're running around bobtailing. Even if it's dry, I might hesitate to do it. It's really easy to slow down a truck when you're bobtailing because you've got so little weight involved. You got 10 tires touching the ground. It's a piece of cake to slow the truck down. Incidentally, this is an interesting phenomenon about brakes on these things, okay? On your car, which brakes wear out sooner, the front or the rear? The front, okay? It's a weight transfer issue, that the weight is transferred this way that wears out these front brakes. On a semi configuration, which brake wears out first? That is. Why? It's got the majority of weight on it. There's more weight on these two axles than this one, and there's twice as many tires, which means you can put you can use twice as much brake. So these brakes actually wear out quicker and sooner than these do. I didn't know that till I'd been driving for many many years. When I asked my mechanic one time, "What the heck's going on here?" Well, yeah, them them they're in the house. That forward axle always wears out first. And he explained it to him. Okay. All right, so when it's wet, if you're loaded, go ahead and use your engine brake. Not a problem. Incidentally, there are places that you can't use an engine brake. Why? Because they make too much noise. And that's the fault of these truckers that run around with no exhaust on them. The ones that you hear going. Brr. Question? When you say engine brake, are you referring to the brake cars? Yes. Engine brake. Engine retarder, Jake brake. It's all the same thing. The reason for the nickname Jake brake? The, well, the regular brake is your foot brake pedal. Okay. The engine brake is the engine. The, well, it's, it's not going to stop you completely, but it's going to significantly slow the vehicle down. Just by decelerating. Right. The, because remember now, when you put fuel, this is a diesel, so I'm not using gasoline. When you put fuel in a motor and it combusts, that creates the forward propulsion. Okay? The engine retarder flips that around. No fuel is going in it, and exhaust valves are being closed. So now you got a piston pushing into a closed area and it and it's getting resistance that creates back pressure or a braking effect so it wants to slow down it doesn't want to go it wants to do the exact opposite of go it's like a two-year-old does exactly the opposite of what you want it to do okay all right now the the nickname jake Greg, by the way comes from the cummins engineer invented this thing in 1960. In 1961, Cummins licensed it through a company called the Jacobs Company to allow Detroit and Mac and everybody else to use this system, hence the nickname Jake Brake. Okay. All right. So go ahead and use the engine brake when it's wet, when you're loaded. When it's snowy, you have to make a decision. Now, the snowstorm we had the other day was pretty slippery, right? So where do you suppose you should be with your truck when it's slippery? parked. 
The manual says you're not supposed to use your engine brake when it's icy. If it's icy, I'm parked, guys. My truck is parked when it's icy. Told you a bit ago, I travel all around the country pursuing this uh, hobby of mine, racing cars. I've There were two trips earlier this year that I canceled. The weather was such, it was not prudent for me to head out. Or just getting stuck out there. You know, it's just not worth the hassle. Right. Yes, and you have to make that decision. That is your decision to determine that it's not safe to continue. Watch the weather forecast. Pay attention to that. You know, you and I live in this age where you've got this technology right here that tells you what's going on. Make smart decisions, okay? But you should not be driving when the roads are icy. Not, It's not worth it. All right, last question on this two point, on page 2.10. What are the two ways to know when to shift? Engine speed and road speed would be the correct answer, okay? All right. Real quickly, it's 2.30. I don't want to go too long here because we promised that this is over at 2.30. I want to show you one more thing real quick here. I want to go to cdltest.co. That's the website I want you using. And you can access this through our website, by the way. What's your website again? Interstatedriving.com. So... This practice test for class A at cdltest.co, the first question, number one, what should you do if you become sleepy while driving? Stop to sleep. What is off tracking is the next question. When your trailer is going wide from your, I said it's right, going wide, your trailer wheels are off the track, you're telling them. The fourth one here. Off traffic is when the rear wheels follow a different path than the front wheels. Oh, I didn't get the reason. I was it off. Okay. What's the most important reason for doing a pre-trip inspection? Safety. These questions are right out of the manual. What's an escape ramp? The third one, a ramp leading to a long bed of loose, soft material to slow a runaway vehicle combination with an upgrade. Oop. So the explanation on it? Well, it at least tells you the correct answer. Now, I have a suggestion for you in terms of a way to study. Let's say you get a question and you get it wrong. Okay? Well, first of all, you can find the correct answer by experimenting with it. So here's a question. What are the two special conditions where you should downshift? Now, we had this a minute ago, right? So what's the correct answer? Okay, so that's the first one, right? But just for the sake of discussion, let me choose a wrong answer. So accident or sudden heavy rain. Wrong, it says. So what I do is I use my back button, go back to the question, select another answer before starting down a hill and going up a hill. You know, and think about that. When should you downshift? Well, before going down a hill, agreed. Should you downshift before starting up a hill? Well, in some cases, yes, right? It depends upon the, the grade and the length of it, but there are times where I would do that, but it's not the correct answer. And it just told me that, sorry, wrong answer. All right. Before starting down a curve and entering, before starting down a hill, before entering a curve. Oh, good, I got it correct. Now, here's my suggestion go back to the question that you had trouble with. Get the correct answer displayed on the screen and then do this. Now, what have you got? You got a study guide, guys. Now you drive out to the exam station. 
pull into the parking lot in your car, put it in park, roll the window down, turn the motor off, put some easy listening music on, and study the questions you had trouble with. Let's see. What are the two special conditions where you should downshift? All right. The correct answer is starting down a hill and before entering a curve. Okay. And then go to the next one that you have a picture of. Isn't that a great way to have a study guide? So if, if, if I'm confident on this, you believe I passed the test. Absolutely. If you've got this nailed, I promise you you're going to pass that test. And, and that's why I was, you notice when I saw the handout you all had given with Trucking Truth on it, I kind of went a little bit ballistic. Because mm -hmm. Trucking Truth is not anywhere near as accurate a website as this CDLtest.co. And so that's what I was upset. I, I make an effort to make sure I'm giving people accurate information, and it drives me crazy when people get inaccurate information. Yes, sir. I've already spent a lot of time on the, the Green Book tests. On which tests? The knowledge tests. Yep. So should I just forget that? I want to do that. Yeah, I would do cdltest.co. It's it's awfully, awfully accurate. Pressing and releasing the brake pedal unnecessarily can let air out faster than the compressor can replace it. True. All trucks, tractors, and buses must be equipped with both emergency brakes and parking brakes. True. The maximum leaky rates for air brake systems should be less than 2 PSI in one minute for a single vehicle, that's class B, and less than 3 PSI in a minute for a combination vehicle, that's class A. And that's true with your foot off the brake. That's true with your foot off the brake. If your foot's on the brake, add one more pound to that. And the, and the test you'll do on your road test is going to be the one with your foot on the brake. And both of those pieces of information are in the manual. Air brake systems have, all air brake systems, have an alcohol evaporator to put alcohol in your air system. No, they don't. Many of them do, but not all of them. Combination vehicles are usually heavier, longer, and require more driving skill. True. All of this is right out of the manual. Coffee and a little fresh air will help a drinker sober up. <laughs> they wish. They wish. If a tire blows out, you should put the brakes on hard to stop quickly. Balls. Okay. All right. Trust me when I tell you that this uh, CDLtest.co is the best and most accurate uh, website test site uh, for you to go to. Okay. All right. That concludes my class. Thanks for coming. If you guys in South St. Paul have any questions, check with the uh, staff up at the front counter. Uh, thanks. Sorry for the little delay getting going today. Have a good day. More important, have a safe day, people.